something about pages constantly beeping. That then took on a meaning of getting noticed and everyone knowing your name. Today, it mostly refers to having lots of money. Back in the 1990s, however, it meant something even more, which was a little harder to explain. Now, yes, it was about being famous, but more than that, it was about being known for something, being considered that guy for whatever your particular skill was. You would know if it was you when somebody said, that's that nigga, or he's that nigga. It was about being that nigga for whatever it was. Maybe you were a DJ or MC or a producer, or in my case, a guy doing video mixtapes. The key was to eventually be known as that nigga. That was blowing up. Now in the 1990s, that was all people like us thought about in our spare time. It seemed like it happened to so many others at the time. It's the classic Hollywood story of being discovered, but in the 90s, it was happening for formerly untrained urban youth in hip hop. It seemed like one day someone would be relatively obscure to most people, then pow, they blow up. One day it's Biggie doing a Super Cat remix. Then, next thing you know, he drops Juicy and Biggie's everywhere. Everybody knows him. Never mind the years of grinding behind the scenes, blowing up seemed more spontaneous. The years of obscurity and hard, thankless work not only paid off, but became a foggy memory in the midst of so much excitement and success. Blowing up embodied the shiny side of fame, the recognition, the accolades, the monetary rewards and upscale access. It's the same treasure anyone has ever sought over the years trying to become famous. And again, like the classic Hollywood story, one day some waitress is trying to break into show business and the next day she's Marilyn Monroe or somebody. The only difference was that in the 1990s, our own art form, hip hop, not Hollywood, was making it possible to blow up. That was something new. Hip hop content started to make a lot of money for all levels in the business, from the producer and the record company to artists and even bootleg music distributors. Hip hop products were a source of stable income for retailers and producers starting in the 1990s, and it seemed like anybody could get a piece of the action. We had our own niche too. Living in Plainfield, New Jersey, my route to travel took me to Newark and New York on almost a daily basis. Since 1989, I co-produced cable shows on local TV, which took me behind the scenes of the emerging hip hop business. Now, hundreds of hours of interviews and outtakes, or B-roll as it's properly called, were stacked up on VHS and three quarter inch tapes in boxes like DJ crates in my apartment. That's what they became to me. Footage was like records or recordings of stuff on video instead of just audio alone. Whether it was performances at shows, street rhyme ciphers, or cats just building on hip hop as a culture, it was all stacked up in plastic storage bins like the kind that you would get at Kmart. It was all documented recordings in boxes of videotapes stacked up in my one bedroom apartment. Most of them were labeled in some random way too, intentionally to confuse my friends rummaging through my stuff when I wasn't paying close attention. DJs back then used plain white labels on records so people wouldn't know what they were spinning. That way, other DJs wouldn't be able to copy their playlist of music. They would have to go search for the music themselves. That's what made a DJ exceptional, the catalog of exclusive and obscure records in their crates. DJs used to be extra secretive about their samples too. They would white label a record with some ill-ass vocals or instrumentation on it and maybe label it number four or don't beat number four just to throw people off. My system of labeling came from that perspective. Friends of mine would question and casually rummage through tapes as we talked and smoked while I edited in my home studio. That was where the idea for Shades of Hip Hop video mixtapes came from. Now, as I played footage we recorded for whatever cable video show I worked with at the time, friends of mine would become transfixed by footage that would never actually make it to the local cable airwaves. The best stuff it seemed was the stuff that was too raw for cable TV. There were guidelines against coarse language and weed smoking for one, and two, people were not accustomed to watching hip hoppers sitting around smoking and building about hip hop or just talking shit. It wasn't flashy enough. People wanted to see expensive videos or exclusive performances. 
And yes, we had that too. That's what we showed on the cable shows across New Jersey on all the major cable networks. Back then it was Store Cable, TKR Cable, and one or two other ones which all ended up being bought by Comcast Cable. Whoa, I was ugly because niggas was scared to look at me. I started reading, reading. On those cable networks, we aired the footage most people knew me for. I was the guy going around to different New York and New Jersey clubs back in the 90s doing local cable shows just like Yo! MTV Raps or Rap City or Video Music Box used to do. Because of our proximity to New York, we got some of the hottest footage of hip hoppers from small clubs on the underground. We taped press days and behind the scenes stuff like you would see on an Entertainment Tonight show for actors and rock musicians. But our footage wasn't as glamorous. Our footage was more raw, made on cheaper cameras with less expensive lighting too. But that was okay for hip hop fans. Hip hoppers in the early 1990s especially looked kind of grimy. Some of us who had grown up during the transformation of hip hop culture from obscurity saw the power this new culture possessed. Other people who wished to capitalize on the growing financial power of rap music recognized the strength of the culture for its ability to generate money. Which might have been the reason why Puffy started wearing those shiny looking suits with mace in the videos. But that's, that's off topic. On one level, hip hop music was trying to floss its financial success and on the other, maintain a hard edged underground credibility in the street. Hip hop had already made its distinction from rap with the whole MC Hammer Vanilla Ice era and the phrase, rap is something you do, hip hop is something you live, which was coined by KRS One. The footage me and my friends liked was on the hip hop side of the equation. Because of that, I had to be careful about showing my friends some obscure, ill ass footage of so and so MC kicking a verse at some badly lit hole in the wall club somewhere that was never actually gonna get shown on cable. Sometimes those tapes would come up missing if they were too obviously labeled. They would be like, oh, Jackson, you were never gonna use that footage for anything anyway. That's the admission I would get back after hours of delving to the bottom of some deep argument about missing videotapes. So I started to rethink the situation and cut them off before they got curious. I decided to put the hot segments we all seemed to like on one videotape. Then if friends wanted to borrow a tape, I could let them, or better yet, they could just buy it for $10 and they wouldn't have to give it back at all. This was back when a good videotape could cost $4.99 so five dollars worth of hot shit was a complete bargain including the tape especially when no one else had the footage this was all the stuff that would never be on cable tv anyway it was raw uncensored unscripted and real life everyday reality something you really didn't see on tv much back then by 1992 when the real world debuted on mtv we had already been mimicking Ralph McDaniel's video music box by taping in all the local spots around New Jersey and then airing it on local cable. However, most of that footage never aired on cable. But in 1995, clips of it were brought back for our first official video mixtape for Shades of Hip Hop called Trains to Newark NYC. Now on that tape, Trains to Newark NYC, which was actually a videotape because it was on VHS, was footage from 1992 when we caught a wicked in-store session with Duck Down's first group, Black Moon, which was comprised of Evil D, Buttshock Shorty, and the Five Foot Accelerator with Drew Ha. So we had new in New Brunswick right now. We're here with my man Drew, who happens to be. One of the most helpful aspects to underground video was the presence of independent video rental stores. Videotape rentals used to be a lucrative business in the 1990s. You wouldn't know that looking around today, but at one time, video rental stores were more popular than bookstores or video arcades. Before the heydays of blockbuster video, mom and pop video stores were a treasure trove of obscure and rare movie titles. Because again, there was no YouTube, no streaming services, and nothing for you to just watch movies at your house unless you owned a copy of it or you rented it. At independent video stores, managers were able to purchase their own product at the full retail cost, then rent the tape to people as many times as they wanted while charging whatever they wanted. 
So because of that, some first run hit movies used to retail for up to $100 per copy on VHS. And then they would rent it for $5 for two days before you had to pay a $1 to $2 a day late fee. Now, movie distributors knew stores would get a heavy return off the rentals and were easily able to get over $50 per tape if they had name brand actors and Hollywood budgets for their movies. The way the stores were set up was very helpful too. The different sections would help guide you to a film you had never heard of or one you hadn't seen in a long time. Unfortunately, there was no real section built for us most of the time. Our projects weren't movies or musicals and there was no such thing as a music video section because nobody had tried to sell their videos for the most part yet. Most of the time, our tapes had long periods where it was just talking with no music videos at all. There would be music as background track, but a lot of it was just interviews and studio sessions. This placed us where we needed to be though, which was in the documentary section. Unlike most documentaries at the time, Ours wasn't about history as much as it was about history in the making. Our documentaries were about current history as it was being written. Shades of Hip Hop was what we call an urban culture video mixtape documentary. In effect, it was like a reality show about underground hip hop through the eyes of some video guys from New Jersey. We just called it Shades of Hip Hop.